This is the Game Tree Biz Microcast on March the 4th, 2024. I'm James Batchelor, Editor in Chief of Game Tree Biz. I'm joined this week by, as always, Christopher Dring, Head of Game Tree Biz, and we have a special guest, Thomas Puha from Remedy Entertainment, Communications Director of Remedy Entertainment, I believe. Correct. Thank you. Good. Please. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Thomas. Really, really do appreciate you joining us on the show. Well, thanks for having me, and don't thank me yet. I haven't said anything interesting yet, so let's <laughs> let's let's, let's oh. see where we end up. But nice to be here. You're going to be you're going to be helping us dive into uh, the biggest news of the past week. But um, first, kind of congratulations, because uh, one of the big news stories of the last week is that Remedy has uh, reacquired or has acquired the rights back to Control. So the Control IP, and then obviously the multiplayer spin-off and the sequel is now fully going to be handled by Remedy. That's, that's fantastic news. Well, we uh, thank you. Um, I mean, we have we always own the IP. Mm. Um, so this was more about uh, publishing rights, uh, which is always a complicated thing. A lot of things are tied 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 into that. Um, but now we have it. All five hundred five is handling the first control until the end of the year, uh, and then now we're kind of evaluating like how do we, how we're going to bring these these games to the market, as I think we said in the in the press release. So I mean, obviously this isn't like a sudden thing. This has kind of been 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 in the works for a while but um it's pretty unprecedented that we're in the situation where both alan wake and control uh in pretty much every way are ours so we we get to decide as a company uh what we're going to do with those so hopefully we are we we decide well (laughs) i've already already seen uh, plenty of people asking for you to uh, take back quantum break as well and and personally as a fan of that game yes i'd like to see more quantum break it's it's funny that people bring that up now um, because when it came out you know there wasn't that it did okay but there wasn't a lot of excitement around that I mean people had a hard time accepting the fact that like kind of half the experience is watching live Mm. action I'm not a huge fan of the amount of live action in our games but like I mean who else has tried to make make a game like that but there's all this you know um, Windows Store back then we launched there that wasn't exactly great so there was kind of lots of different things happening back in February, April 2016 when Quantum Break came up. But like a lot of people have come around since like, oh, that game is actually like great. I'm like, yeah, you know, there's like fantastic story in it. The action's pretty solid. So it, it's got its problems for sure. But it's been interesting to see how people have come around um, to that. But uh, there's a good lesson also, which kind of ties probably into the rest of the discussion, how like that day one or even the first couple of months for a game are just really the the beginning of the journey. That's just so different than what it used to be. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, is it? And we'll talk. Come back to Alan Wake, I guess. But is it a quieter year for you now that you've? Because uh, you've, last year, Thomas, I saw so much of you at you know Gamescom and Summer Games Fest and EGX and you, you know uh, with the big Alan Wake campaign, which it's interesting because. Um, we ran a piece recently of Immortals of Avium and they were talking about how hard it was to get awareness in a year where there were so many massive, massive titles out. But I think Alan Wake managed it. So um, and, and obviously a very nice thing. To, uh, obviously, that's I'm praising you there. But the um, but um, uh, but I, I must have been exhausting. So are you getting a, looking forward to a quieter uh, 24? Uh, well, well, thank you. Um, I mean, it, 23 was stressful, but I mean, a lot of fun. I mean, you know, it's Alan Wake too. So as always, we had all this sort of mm bent up things that we wanted to do that Sam wanted to do that that have been you know waiting for like almost like a decade and like with Epic we pretty much got to do everything uh, we wanted you know we got to do a nice big event we got to do games come and everything and um, so it was it was a lot of fun uh, and I mean I'm a, I'm a workaholic so I, I, I like it um, but uh, def- definitely need a break and it's just interesting where even like uh, look, looking at 24, you know, we have DLC for Wake to to, uh, to work on. It feels like we're a big enough company that there's always like something. Yeah. Like I'm being told like, oh, you should, you know, take your time off, you know, some some overtime accumulated and vacations that I haven't used and that goes for other people as well. And there's always like, every week starts with like, I'm gonna like do some long-term planning, which I bore at because boring. Um, but um, always something comes up, like, you know, all of these uh, control 505 things and then results and whatnot. While I'm not kind of in the center of all of that, 
there's always something that comes up and now it's like already like March. GDC is in two weeks. <laughs> you can go back to GDC. Uh, looks like it. And then yeah. <laughs> there, we have like 10 talks on Alan Wake too. So I'm like, I'm going to kind of have to go look after people there and a bunch of meetings. But um, then it's April and it's just, yeah. yeah. And if yeah. I think- We're halfway through the year all of a sudden. Yeah. yeah. And, and the thing is like, we have so many projects, which is good. But then if you take like an extended period of time off, yeah. then then suddenly you're kind of like behind. I'm already behind. Like I'm, yeah. <laughs> like I've just been in Alan Wake to land for like two years, while other people kind of in the team have slowly started looking into the other stuff. But uh, well, it's good to be busy, and it's good that there's work, especially when looking at all the things that are going on in the industry. So can't can't complain. Well, on that note, um, I'd like to bring up our first story that we're going to be talking about this week is um, more layoffs, unfortunately. Uh, there were two big ones last week. Uh, EA is laying off 670 people, around 670 people, 5% of its workforce. Um, it's closed Ridgeline Games, which is the Battlefield studio that it started with co-creator Marcus Leto, uh, who had already left the studio. It's reportedly cancelled a bunch of games. Um, Respawn's first-person Star Wars game is r- rumoured to be the Mandalorian game. That's been cancelled. Um, that kind of ties in with something that EA's CEO Andrew Wilson was talking about he was saying that the uh, company is moving away from development of future licensed IP that we do not believe will be successful in our changing industry they have since clarified that Black Panther and Iron Man are still in the works but it sounds like they're not going to be as reliant on uh, IP Uh, Sony meanwhile has cut 900 workers 8% of its workforce it's closed PlayStation London studios Uh, some of the studios also affected are Insomniac Games Guerrilla Games Fire Sprite Naughty Dog and it's uh, it seems to be stepping slightly back from the live service uh, strategy it had Um, some of the unannounced games have been canned we don't know which ones rumor is the Horizon one is still in the works um, reportedly a twisted metal game whether or not that was a live service like you know reportedly there was a twisted metal game in the works that's been um, removed I mean unfortunately this has become become almost par for the course in terms of like you know it's another week another bunch of layoffs but these are two big ones and two big changes of strategy yeah we also had some uh, I, I mentioned before we haven't had many studio closures we've had a lot of talk of people yeah. cutting back but here we are we've got two and one of them in London studio is, is like an iconic um an iconic studio and, and obviously SingStar and iToy and, and The Getaway and just so many um, moments throughout history. And it's interesting, actually, both companies are talking, uh, you know, there are, it's, it, I found it, you know, Sony sort of moving away from life, it, not moving away from life service. They've still got a load of them in, in the works. They've just released Helldivers 2, for instance. So they are obviously mm-hmm. still investing in it, but um, they are clearly aware of how challenging that market is now. And they are, you know, uh, correcting um, accordingly, um, which is uh, oh, terrible. But then you've also got what um, EA's, EA's got talking about license IP. And I have to assume that because of the margins on games these days and how difficult um, people are, and, uh, uh, how tight things have become, how costs have keep rising, that a game where you end up giving some of your revenue or whatever to a, an IP, a licensed partner is, is mm. perhaps not as appealing as... I say um, I mean, it was never as appealing as a battlefield or something or building your own IP, but it's um, it's it's perhaps less justifiable. Um, and they, you know they're not bankable. You know these these you know sometimes you get a big license game hit, but then you have something like Suicide Squad, for instance, or something like that, where it's, you, it's not guaranteed. But yeah, it's it's um, <clears throat> uh, it's it's really it's, it's really sad news. Um, and um, um, and you know I really feel for that London studio team. Best place to work awards winners. Um, lots of rave. Um, um, lots of happy staff there and I know they're very excited about the project they're working on um, yeah. so um, uh, yeah terrible yeah it's hard to even know like where to, where to start because it's such a large topic to conversate and obviously really sorry for everybody who who's lost their job and I remember when Sony shut down you know Liverpool which was you know mm-hmm. Signosis originally and all that and I was already like a but that splintered off to a bunch of other good studios but well including I think Fire Sprite but it's yeah. like we have these every once once in a while in the in- industry. Like you know, it's not like the first time that studios get shut down, costs are being cut, and we kind of reset. Uh, but the scale now is just mm. pretty massive. But then again, the scale of games, especially like AAA, has just gotten really crazy. And it's mm. like when people are kind of surprise like why is something 
that's kind of halfway through production cancelled. Like, isn't it like, doesn't it make sense to publish? I'm like, no, it doesn't, because like, it's probably like another 100 or 50 million investment just to get the game done, then do the marketing. And at that point, you're probably like looking at like, okay, it's just like not worth to bring this to the market. And then what happens is, what are we going to do with these hundreds of people we have on the project? Like, this is a thing that like, and I feel for all these people, but like, where do you put them? Where do you suddenly like, oh, like we have 100 extra people, like, I'm sure the game X budget can handle it. Like, no, like, like that's the crazy thing where it's just like, you can't, can't just like shuffle people easily around. And it's, I mean, it, it's, it's super harsh. And like that there's a lot of sort of blame going around, but like, you can also look at it from a point of view, like, well, what if some company would go through with this one game that they're unsure of, they put it out and then it bombs then the whole company is at risk even more people yeah, well, are it, laid we had, I, I had an investor talk to us about it before and I, I didn't actually use it in the article i wrote about investment but he made a point of saying like you know it sounds really horrible but you sort of need to think about the other you know if you're laying you know if you're laying if you're 20 if you're at microsoft and you've got twenty two thousand employees lay off two thousand it's you're, they're thinking of, you know i'm sure they're also thinking about their bottom line and pleasing shareholders and all the things that um but they but they, there is an element of like you know you you sort of cut early so you don't have to cut deeper later on and um you know because because you can hire people back if you need to but you can't get that money back and so it's 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 quite you know it's quite cold calculating um conversations but um but yeah yeah it's you know you if you go through with it and you end up losing more money um and then you end up having you end up might you might be in a far worse situation you if you you can hire people back but if you run out of money you're in trouble and that's um and that's the sort of um brutality of it i guess and i think the big problem is that there's no there's not there's no jobs for people to go to right that's the real um i think that i find really uh the worst thing about this is there's gonna be a lot of people that are just gonna have to leave the games industry as a result of this because there, there isn't there aren't roles for them and that is um you know it's heartbreaking i guess um and um but um the yeah it's a, it's a big topic and we've been talking about it a lot on these podcasts um everyone has their own individual issues right there's all the macroeconomic conditions there's mm -hmm. the fact that video games podcasts is going up as the and so that's you know ea that issue might be licensed games and for sony that issue is live service games and whatever everyone's got this sl slightly different variation of the issues they face but you talked you touched about something there thomas which was um um uh, that I find is is that games take five years to make now, and when you start working on a project, you might think right. Everyone's you know when you started making a project in 2020, everyone was in live service worlds and online worlds and trying loads of things. You think right, this is the future. Let's invest in this. This is where we think the money is, and then three years later, it turns out that that market's super saturated and really challenging, and then you have to recalibrate your thinking and that and that. You know, it was always a thing where games. You know, when you start working on a game, when a game comes out, the market's changed, but it's 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 you know even things like suicide squad like when that game started into development like all those looter shooter things was all the rage <laughs> you know it's um and um and now it's come out and everyone's like no we've moved on thanks and it's it's really hard isn't it um, well we, we talk a lot about it here at like trying to like chase trends i mean hey we, we worked on a free-to-play game that we then ended up ending in in, in vanguard but we had a very small uh, the team on it but like if like you say it takes so long to make these games like basically half a decade and like if you start kind of chasing trends then like things change so fast or always tell people here just let's just worry about making the best game we can and like everything else will kind of you know have a better chance of working out but like I, it's completely understandable that live service is still interesting because like if people struggle paying you know 80 80 euros for a game then we have to find ways how we can kind of like monetize. And yes, we all know that like the market is saturated and highly, highly com competitive and, and people only have so much time and, and, and money to spend that it is just like super difficult. And I think if you look at like how long now the development cycles are, I mean, that's the reason why you're seeing a lot of these remasters. I think especially when I look at some of the Sony studios that you know they usually shipped in every couple of years now it's like five years six years you have to have something to make money during that time I mean this is the thing I mean the remedy is trying to do is like build that portfolio you know control is still you know selling selling some units out there and like we, we try to ship something every year whether it's a game or DLC or, or or something so like the times of just 
working on a game for like really long and you have nothing out there on the market to make money seems like pretty pretty mm. impossible and i love how or well, don't love it how people talk about oh they had break even they're fine i'm like break even is like like the laws of business is probably you should be at least like doubling tripling what what you're making because like people seem to forget that then you know you have to make money for the studio and the developer to be able to make the next game and keep the lights on not mm -hmm. to mention the publisher needs to make money because they have another thousand people who rely on on that game so it's just like the scale has become yeah. um, so massive like it's i mean we talked to a lot of studios so so we know and it's not like i mean Remedies changed its strategy back in 2015 2016 to kind of either you Either you get bought by somebody or then you start working on a bunch of multiple games that you kind of try to split the risk. Um, I'm oversimplifying, but like that's kind of how we ended up approaching it. It's like, let's just work on multiple games and try to ship something, if not every year, then at least a DLC or something. So, mm. but it's, it just become like, you look at the costs and like people always, in some ways, I think there's quite a lot of information out there then people think there isn't. I'm not sure which, which one is right, but like looking at some of these big games where the cost is just the development cost is in like the 200, 300 million dollar range. And then the audience you're selling to, especially on consoles, there's a clear ceiling. I mean, there's what, 50 million PS5s? Yeah. A lot less uh, Xboxes and Game Passes kind of making consumers maybe not 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 buy games so so ultimately it's like like it, the thing is how can you complain about prices of games going up when the cost of making games is like ridiculously higher than it was even 10 years ago and yet the audience we're selling to hasn't really grown so it's just i, I think a lot of these things are kind of coming to head now yeah, well, it's, it's interesting, actually, because I played a Turok 3 at the weekend, which is, you know, a remaster of that game. And it's, that game is six hours long, which I didn't know. I, I remembered it being much, much longer. And that game cost me £50, I think, in 2000, which I think is about £85 today. So, it's, so, so you know, I'm sitting there going, video games have got longer, more complex, deeper and cheaper. I, and, yes. and, I'm, and, I, and I can't, you know, that, that's, the, that's the real journey of these games. And, of course, people are you know value is is is, is a perceptive is a perception thing but in like real terms the games in games and when the games industry is growing and got uh, different revenue streams and different monetization streams um then um it's sort of fine but when um but when we get to the point now where there is a ceiling when that can, the audience isn't growing necessarily and you've sort of tapped out all your dlc and micro, uh, microtransaction options and consumers are saying they don't they can't they don't don't accept any more price increases you've got we've got you've got what we're seeing at the moment and it's um um, it, it's certainly a, a, a difficult time, but you know it's like interesting because remedies. I, will, I might be wrong, Thomas. This might be an old conversation, but I remember remedy sort of very much is like, how do we make incredible? Because Alan Wake Two is a, a look, you know, it looks AAA, right? It, it's, it feels AAA. You know, I don't. There's anyone's doubt in anyone's mind it's AAA, but I imagine it. I, I don't. I don't know what the budget is, but I imagine like they think you want 1.3 million sales you've announced. That seems. And you, you, I mean, the fact you announced it suggests to me you're happy with it, right? And um, and yet there's other games out there that have done double that, triple that, and have been disappointed in those results. And it's it's um, it's, uh, uh, I think people are probably tapping on your shoulder saying, how do you, <laughs> how did you do it? Um, how do you keep these? Uh, how do you how do you make these games um, look that good and not you know spend three hundred million dollars on it? Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I mean, Alan Wake 2 wasn't, I mean, there's a significant budget attached to the game, but like compared to anything that first parties, that shouldn't even compare to first parties, but like even other third parties that that they spend, like the budget is still pretty pretty mm -hmm. sensible. And we, of course, always like try, try to do that. Like I said, we, the fact that we have multiple games, like lessens, lessens the risk that if one game doesn't do massively well, you know, we're not in not not in not mm. in trouble but like uh, I, I don't exactly know how <laughs> it's just blood sweat and tears really how we end up end up making these these games and somehow we were able to um get it get it together but like you know we talk about the complexity of making these games all the time and like how to kind of keep the budgets 
sensible, but I, I look at like we've been around, I think maybe next year, in two years, it's remedies like 30th year. And for like an independent company to survive in this industry for that long is just mm -hmm. incredible. And you no. don't do that unless, well, you need luck, you need good games, but you need pretty damn good, you know, uh, business management skills and, mm. and relationships and, and all those. And somehow we've been able to, able to kind of nav yeah. navigate, navigate all that. But it's not like, you know, it's, it's, what's happening now isn't really a massive surprise. Like costs are just like massively high. Mm. People spend more time on online games, maybe buy less games. I mean, you go back to like PlayStation one, we all played a bunch of different games. Mm -hmm. You know, like you could even millions might have bought something like Parappa mm -hmm. or like Vibribbon or well, millions didn't buy that one. But like, you know, <laughs> like it was just like people just played a lot more different games. It didn't take so damn long. So like, I feel like it, it just isn't like we like we discussed that the cost of making games are gone up, but there's a clear sort of install user base that you have to try to sell. And their time is being spent up because their games are so big. But it's yeah. interesting, actually, because um, in the piece we did with... Um, um, so we, on the site last week, we did an interview with um, Ascendant Studios, Immortals of Avian, which was a flop last year, and Brett Robbins talked about um, how actually sales improved when when there weren't as many big blockbusters that came out. So they've actually seen most of their sales in the last, like, three months. And it's interesting, because I, I don't know... I, I looked at... Um, I know you released the Alan Wake figure, uh, uh, um, Thomas, and I don't know how much you can even talk about this, because it's, it's you and you. Um, but... Um, uh, that game got to a million by the end of the year. And then you've done like 300,000 in just like the first month of the year, which suggests, but I, I'm trying to put two and two together and I'm saying, well, maybe when it, it, things have got a bit quieter um, and maybe it's gone on sale or whatever. I don't know if that it has, I think it has. Um, and that suddenly gives a great opportunity for people that saw it win all these awards and saw the rave reviews, but didn't have to, cause they were busy with Assassin's Creed or Spider-Man or whatever at the time um, or Starfield. Um, they, um, they go, well, now I can pick this up and it, and it's sort of, is that, is that, I don't know if that's something you've seen or if that's something Yeah, I, um, I read the um, uh, interview, the, the article you did, I think it was Brett, right? Yeah. And like when I looked at them, I know nothing but respect to him and, and to that studio, but when I looked at them, their studio, like, oh, they're shipping like original IP and is that like, I don't know, but I was like, man, that's, that's a single game. Are they just betting on that game doing really well to keep the studio going? I'm like, that that's, that's very risky. It's just like selling new IP. It's like no matter what time of the year it is, it's like super difficult. And it's easy to kind of look at like, oh, EA's got the machinery to do it. Like, no, it's not 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 that easy. It's like really, really mm -hmm. challenging. And I'm um, to me like like games used them. You can go back like a decade almost or something where like the first two weeks were pretty much like 90% of your sales. Like that yeah. was the thing. Yeah. It will be in pre just... won't be in the pre-owned bins and you can't, it's gone then, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And like what we looked at, I mean, sure, like always having a great start is obviously great. Like as, as pot sales as we can just just get like as soon as we can, the, the, the better, obviously. But things have just changed a lot. And like, I mean, we had our best selling month on control, I think something like two and a half years, two years or something after launch. Uh, and that, that wasn't just because it was cheaper. I mean, yes, the price dropped, but like, it's like you said, like people just have a lot of games to play. And I think now it's more like, instead of immediately getting a game, oh, that's a great game. And obviously the more awards and the more prestige, everything you get, the more you kind of plant the seed of like, oh, I'm going to get that when the time is right. Now, if the time is right, when there's a discount or something, probably. So, I mean, we've always looked at, I mean, we kept selling control for several, several years. And we've always looked at Alan Wake 2 as well, that like, oh, it's like, you know, 24 is all about selling more copies of Alan Wake as is 25. That doesn't mean we don't want like a great uh, launch, but then people also confuse units sold is a whole different thing than revenue. And as long as you can keep the price up of the game, that it doesn't go down too much, then that, that's, that's, where you want to, that's where you want to be. And there's a lot of examples on, on that. Like when we look at like Sony first party, they're able to keep the price points pretty high for a pretty long period of time and that that to me is really really important so it's not 
a surprise that they're seeing sales like six months after launch and there's always this like oh you launched at the like wrong time i'm like it's just at some point you have to launch yeah. like you never know what's gonna <laughs> land on your date and we moved alan wakes to date by 10 days because of spider-man we're like okay like we won't even get visibility in like the storefronts during those days and media is mm -hmm. only going to talk about it understandably so 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 that made sense but like we absolutely wanted to come out in mm. october make sure we kind of hit the halloween and we make sure that december when you know consumer spending habits are up people want to be buying games we knew we had a good game coming out there's the award season so all of these things matter i mean when i was journalist we we're always like when we we're choosing games of the year we we're like what came out in the spring beginning of the year nobody remembered and you would go through the magazines like oh yeah that game came out so it's like you want to come out in the fall but obviously you know we know all about bad dates when original alloway came out <laughs> with red yes. exemption at all. <laughs> it's like, you just said there's like what brett said in the interview which is like you know we could have perhaps launched the game in february 2024 and said, but then hell divers 2 would have eaten our lunch and it's like you just don't know you know you may you think don't. it's a good window you know I, I think a lot of people thought august was an okay window they didn't expect boulders gate 3 to just go Phew. so um and so you know it's it's um you never know and that's the thing like you know we could move it but then you know we're not necessarily moving to anything better no and like it, it's hard to even explain like once the wheels are in motion like you're not just like spending so much kind of your mental capital that oh there's a date like we can all work towards doing and you all after four years you really want the game out right like it's, it's been long enough it's not necessarily like we want to even spend because we could spend infinite amount of time on on on, on the, these games so at some point you have to get it out and so much is already lined up from whether it's like publisher support and partners and this expecting you to come out and there's like hundreds of things being lined up so like moving the dates is yeah is difficult because of that and like you said you never know what's going to come out yeah like some companies can't afford to just like oh we're going to launch like in two months you're like oh fuck <laughs> like that's going to come out now yeah well, let's look, I guess we're wary of the time, James. Should we move on to the final story? Yeah, I yeah. kind of want to bring up the uh, the other story as well. Like, uh, so the other big story last week, which I thought was quite interesting, was um, Rockstar is reportedly shifting back to five-day weeks um, in the office. So this comes from Bloomberg. Uh, Bloomberg sources kind of passed on an internal email from head of publishing, Jen Colby, uh, which said, yeah, that they're, they're mandating that people need to come back into the office and work five days a week without doing hybrid. Um, they claimed that the well, the email claims that the, uh, the new policy is for productivity and security reasons, adding that Rockstar sees tangible benefits of everyone working in an office. Um, this is kind of a conversation that's been brewing slowly since kind of the end of the lockdowns a good few years ago. Rockstar's not the only people who've started kind of mandating people come back into the office. Um, Activision Blizzard mandated that people do three days a week in the office. Roblox did three days. Ubisoft Montreal mandated two days in the week. Um, I suspect there are a fair number of... Yeah. of managers that would like to see people come back to five days but equally the workforce has really become accustomed to hybrid working um or or even fully remote working i'm i mean i mean thomas like you i'm intrigued to see your thoughts on on remote working versus hybrid I working have a lot of opinions on this so like for <laughs> like i i i can understand rockstar very well they ain't the only ones like i can understand it very well like look i'm i'm finished so i'm like Blunt and I'm like, if you work for somebody, they call the shots, they tell you you got to work five day, days in the office. To me, in some ways, it's quite simple. Mm. Um, unless like other things have been have been promised. I can um, like in, uh, Remedy operates in, in, in a hybrid model. So um, we kind of hope that people average out like three days in the office. But really, it's like teams, you can decide how you want to work. But it's important to like actually meet face to face. And um, I think, like, it, it, again, it's a larger conversation because, like, I think in some parts of, like, the UK and especially in the US, it's like the quality of, like, like this remote working just was a bigger thing there where you're sitting in traffic for hours mm -hmm. yeah. and where there's a culture of, like, oh, you got to kind of, it's not an eight-hour working day, it's actually 10 hours because you have to kind of be there and these sorts of, like, unhealthy things where I'm in Finland, at least maybe I've been lucky. I've always worked at companies, even a remedy where 
even pre-pandemic, it's like, okay, like we've been, you know, working pretty hard. I'm just going to take like Monday or Friday off. And like, that's the conversation. Like, yeah, you should just stay home. That That's fine. Like, it's not like, yeah. that's it. Like I often said, like common sense works. Uh, but in 23, like I was here like every day, like not most weekends, but like I would I'm voluntarily because I like working, but like I would, even on a Saturday, I'd much rather come to work in the office and I live by myself, so I don't have any distractions yeah. except Destiny 2 at home. <laughs> uh, but um, I would just want that separation yeah. where like, I'm just gonna go work for hours in the office and then I'm in that mode anyway. Um, so, I mean, we ship plenty of stuff, like completely remote, like PS5, Series X and S version of Control Ultimate Edition was height of the pandemic, we shipped that remotely but granted it's more of like a port work and that sort of thing but like on wake like most of our marketing team and comms team all sits in the same room and we were all like most of the people were in the office like every day and like when you get to that shipping phase like we had the qa room next to us and for me as the person who kind of also owned player experience and alan wake it's like i need to be seeing like the builds and all the different machines. Like I need to be able to walk in a room instead of at home always like downloading like another 50 gigs mm, yeah. uh, and think things like that. So from like an efficiency standpoint, like I couldn't, uh, most of the leads were all in the office and awake and this wasn't like a mandated thing. It's, it's just what people gravitated to. Mm. Uh, it's just like, yeah. as much as it's annoying that you try to concentrate and somebody taps you on the shoulder like, hey, what about this thing? That's just how it is when it's so complex. Like I didn't have, or we didn't have most of the people have time to like wait three hours for somebody to get back to you on Slack. Now you can say that, well, it works for other companies. Every company is different. Every culture is different. Like all the teams even here are like different. Like the control tool dev team is set up way differently to like the Alan Wake tool yeah. dev team. Yeah. The personalities are different and so on, but like I can, I can understand why companies want employees back in the office. Um, I mean, I, like I said, I was in the office every day in 23 and now in 24, I'm trying to be as much as out of the office as I can because I can make <laughs> it easier. And that's yeah. like, I like my free time, but I can see like the benefits. Uh, but like, it's incredible to me that like, Insomniac, I think, mostly operates remotely and like they put out incredible yeah. games. Mm. So it's not like you can't. It, can't I think it, I find it depends. Studios operate differently, right? And some, 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 you know, it's really str it's really struggled with the move to remote or hybrid working, and some sort of embraced it and it's worked for them. And it depends on the people, it depends on the project, it depends on the, you know, it depends on so many things. That's what I find. And obviously, Rockstar had that other element where they're, they're basically working on the, they're working on a, the, they're going to work on the biggest entertainment launch we'll ever see, right? They're looking yeah. at this is going to be massive, massive, massive. And um, had, already the PR plan hasn't gone to plan because mm. of all these leaks and all these things. You know, having that control as well um, is important. I think the challenge, I think, is that for so long now people have been used to hybrid working. And when you think about the cost of living crisis, and you think if you've got kids, you know, the cost that you have to pay on nursery fees and if, you, mm. if you're not going to pick them up on time from school, or the, you know, that, that um, quality of life thing, you know, the, tr the tr cost of travel and the cost of commuting. Of course, it's different if you live next door to the office and, and it's... Um, and you are, uh, uh, you know, maybe you don't have those sort of dependencies and stuff. It, it's, it's, it's different. And that is the challenge. That's the hard thing. And I think the, re the real hard thing is that we're in a, We're talking, talking about the layoffs just earlier. The employees for a long time had an awful lot of power when there was this war for talent and everyone was fighting over all the, the limited senior people out there. Um, you know, it, you know, everyone was going, OK, we're going four day working weeks and we're going to increase salaries, increase benefits, and remote working and hybrid working. Basically, we just want you to join us. Please join us. We'll offer you whatever you want. And now the situation's reversed. You know, the employees ultimately, if they could sit there and get annoyed and walk out of Rockstar, but actually, where do they go? And it, it's the, the power that's shifting. And obviously, you just hope people aren't being, you know, dicks about it, basically. And it's, um, and, um, but it's, and it's really difficult, right? you know, depending on the person, it might be, it might be really costly. Um, you know, I, I'm actually somebody that actually really values being in an office with people. But at the same time, if I was asked to go into the office every day, I'd be like, oh, but I, that would be less time with my boys and that would yeah. be um and that's and that's where it and that's where uh, uh i guess rockstar's gonna have to manage that um those conversations and do what they can hopefully do what they can um to uh, but i understand why they would want to do it particularly this close to the launch of what will be the biggest um entertainment launch in history 
Yeah, yeah and it's there's a, sorry, there's no like you know every like I said every company is different and employees are different and locations are mm-hmm. are you know different. Like the commute here in Helsinki, like my commute's like 25 minutes or 30 minutes, and by Helsinki standards, it's actually surprisingly <laughs> long on public transport. So I totally feel for like people in like LA or London where like like. If I would have to sit in the car for 90 minutes one way while I worked on Alan Way 2, that would have just been terrible. <laughs> yeah. I had just absolutely terrible. So I, I, I get it. Uh, but it's, you're in these weird situations where like these big companies obviously have big, nice offices and like they're paying for them because like often the lease has to be done for like, I don't know, like five years. Mm. So it's like insane empty offices that you can't even get out of like the deal of having them so there's also that like maybe people should be here but i think ultimately what matters is like how can you ship games and not like work people to you know to death and like how can you make it uh, the, the process as smooth as possible i mean that's that should be the the main thing but like i think for a very long time it worked that people are in the same physical space for at least a couple of days mm. and i don't think that's gone away but it's such a like role specific thing there are several like there's a couple of people at remedy who are fully remote and they do a very specific thing so like they don't necessarily every fucking day have to be talking with somebody mm. to get the lay of the land so so to speak so it it's yeah it's true. It, it's it's challenging at, at least i like the way we do it that it's this kind of hybrid where in the office sometimes um away and it, it's like it's sensible I'm interested to see who goes next. Rockstar, as far as I can tell, is the first one that's gone back to the full five-day week. Um, I'm intrigued to see if other companies kind of use this as not an excuse, but kind of a jumping-off point. It's like, well, if we're not the away, we're not we're not the first movers now. Like, yo, yeah. we would like you back in yeah. five days a week, or even even pushing up to four days a week or something. Like, yo, I'm intrigued to see how this evolves over the next year or so mm-hmm. as people push towards getting you know certainly managers of certain companies push towards um, getting people back into the office. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's really, like I said, companies are different. So I know some are already man- mandating it and maybe with pretty much the same same reasoning. So it, it's yeah. everybody operates in, in somewhat different ways. Mm-hmm. I think we're going to wrap it there because we are definitely beyond micro for this podcast. Definitely into megacast territory. Definitely into megacast territory. Thomas, thank you so much for joining us for our first megacast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. No, it's a really, really appreciated time. Hopefully, uh, hopefully have you back on a, another week and uh, hope, hoping your 2024 is a bit quieter as, as yeah. we originally hoped. So. I don't think it will be, but <laughs> let, 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 let's see. Well, best of luck with GDC. Um, thank you, dear listener or viewer, for uh, sticking with us for the entire episode. Um, if you want to check out previous microcasts, they're on the podcasting platform of your choice or on the GameStreet.biz YouTube channel. Uh, we are going to be back next Monday with the next mi- uh, microcast, and you can find more news, insight, and analysis into the world behind video games at GameStreet.biz. 